you may not hear it. You may not feel it. But most 35-year-old single women who desire to have children are walking God's green earth with a low-grade anxiety that revolve around their biological clocks. Have you ever stopped and imagined what it would be like if the clock simply didn't exist? Probably not if you're a man, because the burden of reproductive health falls so greatly on the shoulders of women. This is also the reason most men are unaware that they are not the bearers of immortal sperm. A rare yet recent study of birth outcomes associated with paternal age found that men over the age of 45 develop geriatric swimmers that increase the health risk of their partners and children. Yes, men have biological clocks too. But for them, here's the rub. A man needs a woman to bear his children. Women just need sperm. And because of this, there is a growing demographic no longer waiting for that perfect guy to help them fulfill their desires to be a mother. Cryos, the world's largest sperm and egg bank, reported more than half of their customers are single mothers by choice, SMCs. And of those single women, 78% were between the age of 36 and 45. Although single mothers still carry a stigma in society, this hasn't deterred some women from pursuing motherhood in this radical way. Today... We're talking to two women who happily did. You're listening to The Maiden Myth, a podcast that challenges myths about single women, myths that shape the way society sees us and the way we see ourselves. In this episode, I'm joined by the hosts of Mocha SMC Podcast to challenge the myth, you'll never experience motherhood. We're hearing two unique stories where the women defy this myth against all odds. So I will say right off the bat, anybody who knew me from like the age of 12 would not have thought that I would be a single mother. I wanted to be a mom. And so when I thought about it, I was like, you know, if I get to the end of my life and I never get married, like, I think I'll be okay. If I get to the end of my life and I never have more kids, like, I'm going to be upset. Just like, I want to have a baby and I don't think I'm going to have a baby. And she was just like, why don't you just go out there and get some sperm and go get your baby? And I was just like, okay. I'm your host, Sophia Stevens. We'll be right back after this quick break. Before we get started, make sure you're subscribed to The Maiden Myth on iTunes so each week when an episode drops, it will download straight to your device. Are you listening on Spotify, watching on YouTube? Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you'll never miss an episode. Will you please define SMC in your words? Yeah, so single mothers by choice basically just means that you are choosing to not co-parent from like the point of inception. This is Hera, one half of the podcast, Mocha SMC. And inception could be like, you know, when this became a thought, like you're going to decide to adopt or like at the point that you decide to actually like get pregnant. And so I think the, oftentimes people get confused because they're like, well, I chose to be a single parent when I left my ex. And it's like, yeah, You did choose to leave your ex, but like you initially chose to become a parent with that person, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, we call that like single mother by chance. Like you, Mm -hmm. you know, like your initial plan did not work out, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Not that there's anything wrong with that. We don't Mm -hmm. like, we, we don't try to like throw shade or anything. It's just a very different experience. And I think why it's so important for us to have um, a space that is, that is unique to the the SMC decision is that there are topics that we grapple with that a single mother by chance wouldn't grapple with. Like, for example, mm-hmm. sperm donor, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, there is a dad in that situation. Uh, mm-hmm. And so it's a very different experience. And then, you know, co-parenting, for example, like we don't co-parent. So, right. you know, some of the things that might come up in a in a single parenting forum And that do come up very often because a lot of times people have co-parenting drama. We -hmm. don't have. Uh, And so I remember when I first became an SMC, I joined a local single mothers group 
and I felt very out of place. I was like, these are not my people. Um, because like they were, you know, they were talking about child support and like, you know, Oh, like this deadbeat, like co-parent mm -hmm. of mine. And I was like, I got any of this drama and I'm so uncomfortable. And I don't know how to contribute to this conversation other than being like, Oh, that sucks. Unlike single mothers by chance, single mothers by choice approach motherhood with an awareness that everything ultimately falls on them. In some ways, this advantage can be empowering. In other ways, tackling parenthood alone, whether planned or not, it's still daunting. It made me wonder, what leads a woman into choosing to do this alone? So I was a single mother already. Um, I started my motherhood journey as a single mother by chance. Um, I definitely did not want to be a single mother. Like I will put that out there. Like when I was in my twenties, I was like, I'm going to do this right. I'm going to check all the boxes. I'm going to like yeah. get married and then have babies and you know, life happens. And, and you look up and you're like, dang, like I definitely did not do this the way that I planned. Um, unfortunately I ran into a bona fide psychopath and, um, had a pretty horrible abusive relationship that led to me leaving him when my son was two weeks old and then going through a horrible custody situation where I tried to protect my son from him after I learned that my son's father was essentially uh, allegedly a serial killer. I say that because he wasn't actually convicted at the time of anything. Um, and unfortunately, after 15 months of this, my son was killed by his dad, which is probably one of the most horrible things that could proceed being an SMC. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, for me, it was trauma. Like I just having gone through that situation. I was like, I don't want to co parent with anybody anymore. And I also, I think for me, like having been a single mom in like possibly the hardest way possible. There was never a question of like, could I do it? Because I was like, of course, and like, it's going to be so much easier than like, the way that I did it before. Right. Um, so I didn't grapple with that. It was more just that like, I wanted to be a mom. And so when I thought about it, I was like, you know, if I get to the end of my life, and I never get married, like, I think I'll be okay. If I get to the end of my life, and I never have more kids, like, I'm going to be upset. Yeah. Uh, and so I also thought a lot about just, I was like, you know, I'm not going to let my ex steal my joy forever. Right? Like, that's not going to happen here. I, I want to, I want to take my life back. And so for me, like having my daughters, the way that I had them was like, was like my way of living. Like, um, I remember when my son died, you know, I felt like I had two options. I was like, okay, you know, I could either like crawl in the casket with him and die or I could keep living. And, and for me, like, you know, knowing that going through pregnancy, like your kid becomes part of you. I was like, if I die, then he's really dead. Like there's nothing else of him left. And so I was like, I have to keep living because he can't. And, you know, I chose to keep living. And I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, I do a lot of like advocacy mm -hmm. work for um, uh, victims of child abuse and women um, who are victims of domestic violence and stuff. And in a way that helps me like feel like I'm still parenting him um but yeah I just I wanted to be a mom again and I wanted to keep living and so I'm so thankful that this was an option for me because if I had had to like rush out and like try to get into another relationship it just wouldn't have been possible so yeah what would you do if life were to lead you down an unconventional route to the very thing you want how would you handle the pushback from family and friends would you face the judgment within your community or leave and form an entirely new one where there's support? Well, Hera chose both. I mean, I think that no matter what, no matter how supportive your community is, like if you choose this path, since it's a non-traditional path, and even mm -hmm. though we're trying to like, you know, evangelize this and make it more normal, <laughs> right. uh, and that's like one of my goals in life, um, there's always going to be a hater, Right. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that you will meet men who don't have very strong sense of self, who will feel weird about it. And you mm -hmm. will meet men who are just like, oh, that's awesome. I wish I had that option. Right. Yeah. 
Um, and, and same with family. Like I came from a pretty religious background. I mean, my parents aren't like extremely religious, but they're both like from pretty Christian households. Mm -hmm. And so my extended family, uh, you know, definitely had some questions, right? They were like, well, why don't you wait for like Mr. Right? And they were, (laughs) you know, like they just, they were like, well, how does this work? And, you know, I had friends who were like, why don't you just go get knocked up at the bar? And I was like, you clearly don't get what I'm trying to do here. Like, I want (laughs) to try to limit the drama. Like, um, so yeah, I I mean, like I, I, I had to reevaluate my community Mm. when I was taking this path. Cause for me, my thing was like, I'm not going to have anybody around my kids who is going to spew negativity related to their conception story. Right. 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 Um, but I will say like, I was probably most nervous about how my dad would feel really because I was like, is he going to feel weird because he's a dad? And like, he's, you know, like I just, and I remember when I told him, he told me this story about how in Scotland, he was like, you know, hundreds of years ago, this story about like how some of our family members, like, I guess the rival um, clan came and like burned down the church and like everyone died except for the people who like happened to not go to church that day. Right. But like most of their family members died. And he was like, you know, if they had chosen not to just get up and keep living by any means necessary, we wouldn't be here. Right. And so he was like, you go get your baby. <laughs> However you want to be a mom, like I'm going to be totally supportive. And I was just like, wow, like that's really cool. And I think for him, like, you know, what happened to me was not just traumatizing to me, it was traumatizing to my entire family. Right. And so I think my dad was thinking like, well, damn, this makes me feel a lot better because now I don't have to worry about like her rushing out to find another dude who might be not great. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, so yeah, like people who I didn't expect to be supportive were supportive. The people who, the people in my extended family who were like throwing initial shade. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say that like those people have revisionist history now, Mm. Uh, cause like now that the kids are here, they're like, Oh, I was always supportive. This is such a great idea. Let me run the tape. Like, Let me run the know. tape back. Yeah, exactly. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> okay. I mean, you know, I think I just also allow people some grace because I understand that it's hard, yeah. you know, like when people are from a different generation mm-hmm. and you know, they, there's nothing in their experience that would kind of prepare them for this life. And so I'm the first person they know that yeah. has done this. So you know, now, like, you know, my aunt will be at work, and she'll be like telling her friend, like, Oh, you better go tell your daughter to do this, right. But like, you know, 10 years ago, like, that wasn't a thing. There's another reason some women would be hesitant to take this route into motherhood. Women are physically vulnerable in this state. And this level of vulnerability mixed with raging hormones and cravings is not generally what one would sign up to do alone. However, Hera's past experience, once again, led her to see this much differently. So I will go back to when I was pregnant with my son. And I think this was, so my only experience, you know, being pregnant with a partner was a bad one. (laughs) So I think that also like sort of colored my experience when it was solo because it was actually better in many ways. Um, So when I, I, when I was pregnant with my son, I was 30, I had him at 31. And then I got pregnant with my oldest daughter at 32. Um, And it was, I decided to move forward with the process the day my ex got arrested, January 25th, 2012. (laughs) It was literally like, as soon as I found out, I called my doctor and I'm like, let's go. Was it like a celebratory Um, move? I think it was just, you know, I... I felt like I needed to be safe. Like I didn't feel, I didn't feel safe until he was actually arrested. Um, and I didn't, and I didn't, I was like, I can't, you know, I can't move forward with this until there's an element of safety here because I'm not going to bring another kid into a situation where it's like unsafe. So once he was finally arrested, I was like, okay, we're doing this. Right. Um, I had already chosen a sperm donor. So I had, you know, I had the sperm on ice and called the bank and was like, deliver it to my doctor started going through the whole process. And, um, I just felt, I, I hated pregnancy for like the, all the aches and pains, but I will say that like the entire process of going through having my oldest daughter saved my life 
because like from the moment that I had her in me, I was like, I am a mom again. Like I felt like I was part of society again. And I was like able to keep living because I wasn't just living for myself. And so, yeah, like I will, I will say that it just saved me. Like it just made me feel human again. Like it made me feel like myself again. Um, and And I will say just again with community, like, yeah, no, I didn't have some dude there rubbing my feet. But like, you know, at the time, my sister was um, living with me for probably the majority of my pregnancy. And she laughs about it now. She was like, oh, my gosh, the chocolate cake runs I had to do. (laughs) You know, and like, I just I had such a great community that like, if I really needed something, there were like at least five people on my speed dial that I could call and be like, I need ice cream now. (laughs) And so in a way that like in my first pregnancy, I mean, I was in an abusive relationship. So like, I mean, you know, with my first pregnancy, I remember being like violently ill and my ex like throwing a pot at my head and telling me that like, I should just not throw up on his floor. Like it was just like such a different experience. And so for me, I didn't, I didn't feel like, morning having a partner there I was just so thankful that I was like safe and my kid was safe and like you know I could just like eat chocolate cake (laughs) and not have like you know like the emotional abuse that came with my first pregnancy the made a myth podcast appreciates the support of every listener we enjoy creating content that empowers women and although our team is modest in size we're committed to sharing quality content this of course requires more time effort and money If you love what you're hearing and want to hear more, please consider donating to our podcast. No donation is too small. Links are available on this podcast page. You can also make a contribution at themaidenmyth.com. Thank you. Now, back to our show. Oh, Finny, I'm watching you go down in flames and you're bringing me with you and I can't do anything about it. This is a clip from the film My Cousin Vinny. In this scene, Mona Lisa, Vinny's girlfriend, is venting a common frustration to him. And? Well, I hate to bring it up because I know you got enough pressure on you already, but we agreed to get married as soon as you won your first case. Meanwhile, 10 years later, my niece, the daughter of my sister, is getting married. My biological clock is ticking like this, and the way this case is going, I ain't never getting married. So many women have been in the same situation, having the same conversation, with dreams of marriage and carriage at the mercy of a man's readiness. Women like my next guest. So I will say right off the bat, anybody who knew me from like the age of 12 would not have thought that I would be a single mother. This is Aisha, the other half of Mocha SMC. I was a rules girl. I was a rules follower. I had a vision of a correct order of doing things in um, an equally yoked right situation, right? Quote, unquote, right situation. And so I set off to do that. And so I met a wonderful guy, individual in college, and we dated for our entire college career, my entire college career. So in told we had an 11 year relationship. And so when it, when we graduated, you know, the next natural thing was to get married. And so it was not as smooth as that. There were lots of theoretical conversations about how we envision ourselves marrying, how we envisioned our life as parents. And he would just say things like random crazy things about, you know, him having total control and, you know, the kids being raised a certain way. And I'm just like, yeah. So, you know, we would, we would kind of butt heads on that, but we kind of pushed through because we loved each other and we thought, at least I thought that, you know, love would conquer all and that, you know, we would meld together and become this unit that, you know, rolls out these great little people into the world. And that did not happen. I say that to say that it was not all on him, that there were, there was a part of me that was just like, oh, he doesn't really mean that, you know, no matter how crazy it is, that was how he envisioned his life. That was not how I envisioned my life. And I never fully was sold on it, but I loved him and I wanted to be with him. You know, I love him. Right. (laughs) So in spite of their differences, they got married. It took some time for the issue of kids to be brought to the surface because they were young and taking advantage of their youth. 
But then I started getting the itch, you know, Mm -hmm. I was living in a slower paced city and I was just like, yeah, okay, I'm ready. I want to have kids. And he's just like, no, remember that, that whole total control thing? I really meant it. And so we spent probably a year pushing and pulling on total control. And like, what does that mean? And he meant total control with me as the worker bee. And so the gap between me wanting to have kids and us continuing to have this conversation, I kept progressing in my career. I went to grad school and I graduated. And so I I knew what my career path was. And so by not having kids, that freed me up to say, okay, I want to explore these career opportunities. And so I landed a job that took me away from Pennsylvania back to New York. And so we, we lived separate for probably a good year was going on 18 months where it was still, I want total control. You need to quit that job and come back. Um, but eventually I convinced him that the right move for us was to move together, um, and land in like central Pennsylvania. So, um, and so he did that, but he was bitter. He was bitter. He was hurt. He still didn't want to give me babies. He said, I, I never intended to be the Um, primary caregiver of a child. And so my job required travel. So he said, if you're going to be still traveling with this job, you need to take the kid with you or find childcare arrangements. And I was just like, whoa, what is this? And so eventually I realized that the things I was asking him to do just were not things that sat right with him. And I I have always been a person to leave people as whole as I can lead them. So I loved him. This was not working for me, was never going to work for me. It was not working for him. So I made the decision to get a divorce. Married at 23, divorced at 29, and still without the children she wanted. Yet Aisha remained hopeful and decided to try again. I had to start from scratch and, you know, find out who I was as a single woman because I had never been a single woman. Right. I entered college at 18, 19. He was my everything through 29. Oh, my goodness. And so (laughs) and so anyway, long story short, got out there dating. And while his um, his uh, caveat was that he needed to have total control, everybody had requirements. Uh, You know, I'm I'm not ready. I already have my kids. Um, I don't plan to be in this area long. So it was just things. And so eventually I sat back and I was just like, you know, I might not be a mom. So this was like at 32 coming to this realization, I might not get a chance to be a mom because my time is running out and there is nothing out there in the dating world but pain right now for someone who wants to be a mom to be told, I already have my kids. So you you either stay with me or not, you know? So then I was just like, okay. So I started Google searching and I stumbled upon, you know, getting pregnant on your own. I had always known that there were like sperm banks out there. Um, And so I was Googling, I was in like um, some of the popular apps for um, people having babies and things like that. And so I was just like, how do I get started? And so they were just like, you know, you talk to an RE, which is, I was like, what's that? A reproductive endocrinologist. They were like, that's where you start. And so I began having the conversation with my, um, my G, my OBGYN. And she was just like, yeah, great, go for it. You know, and I still couldn't do it because for someone who's so used to the rules, it's just like, okay, what are people going to say? What are people going to think? You know, my sisters had all had kids you know, by the time they were like in their mid twenties. So I was the last one. And so I would be crying. I'm like, I want to have kids. And it's just like, well, why don't you adopt or you have everything? Why do you want this other thing? And you're crying about it. And so finally I cried um, to my um, foster mom, my stepmom. Um, I call her and I was just like, I want to have a baby. And I don't think I'm going to have a baby. And she was just like, why don't you just go out there and get some sperm and go get your baby. And I was just like, Okay. And so that is when the seed firmly took place. So you felt supported and I felt supported. And I think you needed that. Like women, women, sisterhood is so important because when I was going through my divorce, it was my, my big sister and my foster mom who was like, don't do that. Don't leave your job. Don't do these things that my ex-husband was asking for out of love. Right. Mm. And so then, you know, my foster mom was a 60 something year old 
deeply religious woman who had gone through a divorce, had four grown children. And so there's something about looking back and having perspective that I think, you know, is where her words came from. It's just like, you know, do this because this is going to fulfill you, not the marriage, right? Having been divorced, me also being divorced, not the marriage, not anything else. If this is something you feel driven to, go ahead, do that. Go get yourself a baby. It's just that easy. And, you know, so to the extent you need that village of women to encourage you to see, to make the impossible possible, to help you get out of your way, you know, was invaluable. And even with that level of support, Aisha still had to deal with pushback in her community and family from men and women. I did get pushback from from the men in my life, but I also got pushback, very subtle pushback when I was like, I was crying and I had a sibling say, oh, you have everything and you can't have this one thing. So you get that kind of pushback when you're at a very vulnerable point in your life. Like, oh, nobody wants you. You're unworthy. That's why you have no kids and you're barren. And, you know, if you want to have kids and you, you put it off and you've been, you know, taking pills. Um, and then when you want to have kids, you want to turn to God to give you kids. So I got that kind of pushback from women. Wow. So it was like a literal kick in the uterus, right? And it's yeah. just like, um, okay. But the way that I address that pettiness is the way I address an, unpre- uh, an unplanned pregnancy that a friend had, is that those kids are going to be here. They're going to come, whether you like it or not, whether other people like it or not, that kid is going to thrive. That kid is going to be happy. That kid is going to run around. That kid is going to be all alive in your face, right? (laughs) Because that's, that's what new life does, right? That kid is going to cry. And if you're that person who was like, don't bring that kid into the world, you're the devil's spawn. You're the worst person in the world. The very presence of that kid will have you eating crow every day you see that child. So think real, real hard about what you say about somebody's baby because right. the very success of their presence will make you die a little inside each time. Judgment from the sisterhood is painful, especially when you are in need of empathy, love, or at the very least grace just to figure it out. As for the men, Aisha experienced that pushback in a different way. It's a very pernicious type of pettiness. That's why I want you to talk about this. So, and these are, these are from guys who are good good guys, good people, dating guys that I would date guys that I have dated. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it comes in the form of no, why don't you just wait for, you know, for a man to come into your life? Why don't you just do it the right way? Meanwhile, you're 52 dating a 36 year old telling me to wait. Listen, when you have your grown kids and you want me to wait because it, but still date you while I wait, right? The, yeah. the, the cognitive dissonance there still date you while I'm supposed to be waiting for a partner to have a baby with. That's incredible. And, right. And so it's just like, you want all the things that comes with a single attractive woman with all of the free time and disposable income and nothing but attention to dote on you. Right. But yeah. when it comes down to the things that she wants, oh, you just don't want to give her a baby. And so it's just like, so it's that, that type of response. And then also, Oh, you know, I think that's great. It's so empowering. I mean, you're doing the thing, but don't you think that it's kind of, you know, um, breaking down the black family? And what do you say to that? How do you even respond to something like that? To be honest, you know, it just rolls off my tongue, you know, because I'm like, well, that's a lot to put on black women because what I actually think is destroying the black family is misogyny. Come on. Domestic violence. Hello. Infidelity. Mm Mm-hmm all types of emotional abuse, instability, financial instability, all of those things are breaking down the black family. My little self connecting a sperm with an egg inside my uterus, not going to make a difference. If I stay childless, not going to make a difference, right? So I am not going to overcome history. Me, 
myself in my lifetime, not going to do it. But perhaps you keeping it in your pants Mm. or you keeping your hands to yourself or you loving black women as partners might just change something. And one person can do that. Right. How was your experience of being pregnant by yourself? Like, so, what was that like? That's a good question because I think, remember we talked about the pettiness of people. Yeah. And you get it the most when you're most seen and you're most seen when you're taking up more space, right? When your belly is bigger, people start to notice not just that you don't wear earrings or something. They notice you don't have a ring on your finger, right? And so that is the most visible I had ever been seen by everybody. And Did you think to put a ring on your um, your finger? I was not going to do that because one, I had already been married. I was already in my 30s. There was no need to have a pretense. This was the life that I was going to live and I'm going to live it out loud, you know, and and that's not to say that I was not nervous, Mm -hmm. but it is that I am going to live my life above all else. I'm going to live. Right. And so I was not going to, to fake the funk on that. One of the things I've learned from all of my friends who've experienced pregnancy is that every pregnancy is different. So I asked Aisha to describe her two pregnancies and boy, am I glad I did. They were literally night and day. Everything about the first pregnancy, trying to conceive with the first, everything was textbook and smooth. I got pregnant on the second IUI. I claimed that pregnancy from the time I got a positive pregnancy test. I told all the people and the pregnancy was textbook. I ate whatever I wanted. It was, I did water, Zumba, Aqua Zumba, you know, (laughs) delivery was, um, she came at like 38 weeks, um, which is considered full term, but 40 weeks is what they wanted. Um, And, you know, when she was born, she was jaundiced. Now this is important because this is where my unexplained secondary infertility came from. She was born jaundiced, heavily jaundiced because our blood types mixed in our systems. And so my body ended up attacking hers. So up until that point, it was textbook. And even after that, you know, that was a blip that yeah. happened, but the rest was textbook. And I thought, you know, I've got this amazing little baby. She was such an easy kid. And then when she turned one, I was like, all right, I'm going at it again. I can I'm do, do it this again. again. Yes. I'm like, you know, and life has a way of humbling you. Cause I was just like, yeah, I'm gonna do this again. It's gonna be easy. And it was not. Not at all. Aisha decided to undergo IUI as she did for her first pregnancy. And just as before, the first treatment was unsuccessful. So she tried it again. Only this time, the second treatment was also unsuccessful in spite of using the same sperm. Her doctors assured her that with her good fertility numbers, IVF will be successful and they were right. She got four grade A embryos and pregnant on her first round. At about six or seven weeks, I claimed the pregnancy. I was telling people I was having nausea at work. I was just like, this is great. And then I miscarried. What? Mm -hmm. I miscarried at eight and a half weeks. And I was on the table and they were like, there's no heartbeat. Oh my goodness. So I miscarried and that just caused a catastrophic event. I had a two cycle package. I was like, I'm not doing it again. I'm not, I'm done with this. I can't do this, you know? Um, and then I did it again. Aisha began her second round of IVF and once again, got four grade A embryos. The result of the transfer, one didn't take and the other resulted in another early miscarriage she decided it was now time to change clinics. I found a clinic that was supposed to be one of the best on the East Coast. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna go all in, I'm doing this. I'm going to spend two weeks at that location. I took two weeks vacation. I brought my daughter with me. I did the monitoring appointments. I did everything. And I got, was supposed to have like 14 follicles. They retrieved five. And then one was, um, they sent it for um, testing. It was abnormal nothing. That was a $21,000 cycle, nothing. And so then I was just like, okay, something is clearly wrong. Having been in the SNC spaces, I knew that there was a such thing as donor egg and donor egg was seen as almost a guarantee because they were young 
eggs from young donors. It took time for me to get to the point of being okay with donor eggs. And I had considered adoption. I had considered um, adopting it using one of my friend's leftover embryos. And I was like, oh, well, if I'm there, I'm already here. Right. So let me just go ahead and use donor eggs. And so still using my daughter's sperm, I was like, we're going to do this with donor egg. And so I got three embryos. It's just like, yeah, this is great. This is going to happen. It was perfect. The fertilized donor egg was successfully transferred. And then? I had another early miscarriage. And I was just like, okay, I'm just pretty much really done. I don't, I, yeah. What made you want to go on? Okay. So part of it was that I had so much money invested. I could not walk away with nothing. Right. And so that is what kind of made the decision to switch to donor egg a bit easier because I was just like, I'm coming out of this with something. Right. Then I got down to my last try and my last bit of money. Well, since she brought it up, let's talk about the money. It takes a lot of it to raise children. And I don't know about you, but the idea of going into debt before my child even gets here terrifies me. This was starting to feel like a rich woman's game. I actually brought this up to Hera, the first woman I interviewed. Here's my issue. Uh, the money. It is yes. incredibly expensive, right? It so what is. was that like for you? And do you have... Suggestions for women who are I not do. quite. Oh, so uh, there are there are a few things you can do. There are some bank or there's some there's some clinics that actually have um, payment options. So payment plans for like IVF cycles. Uh, CNY is a fertility clinic that a lot of women use because their IVF cycles are less expensive than some others. And I know women that actually fly into New York for the treatments just because it's like so much cheaper than wherever they're, wherever they're located. Um, there's also, you can look at what companies have certain fertility benefits. Uh, and I know for one, like, even if you work at Starbucks part-time, they actually will pay for, um, like IVF and fertility benefits. Like it's interesting because a lot of people don't know this and there's women in our group that actually work there for like the time that they're going through the process. And then they're like, peace. <laughs> I, I know that like sounds really controversial, but at the same time, like if you can stomach being a barista for a time period, it could be really beneficial as like a side I hustle. I know that. Wow. Yeah. I um, did not know that. Anything so, else you got? So yeah, there's also, I know women who, will, you know, I think the public school system in Long Island, maybe it is New York, um, pays for fertility benefits. I know women who like take certain jobs for a certain period of time, just so yeah. that they can kind of get through that, right. And you may be like taking a pay cut in one sense, but you know, you're playing the long game and you're like, all right, right I'm going to take a pay cut here. So I get these fertility benefits. And then I'm going to, you know, once I have my baby, go back to doing what I was doing uh, before. Well, what do you know? It's good to know that we have options. But let's get back to Aisha, because with the pressure on her time and money at its highest, she became even more determined to self-diagnose what was going wrong. I kept trying along the way, talking to my doctors about the hemolytic disease of the newborn, that my body attacked my daughter's um, blood cells. And if I had um, embryos created with the same donor that had the same blood type, could this be causing my miscarriages? None of them listened to me. Oh and so God. when I switched to donor egg, because what did I do? I changed clinics. Mm -hmm. I changed protocol. I got new eggs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's now, everything. in a male-dominated society, nobody thought to look at the sperm. This is the problem. So when it came down to my last money, and it came down to me about to risk it all, I wanted to bet on myself. And so using donor egg and donor embryo is so easy to make the switch. So what I did was I looked back through the donor egg catalog. I found a donor that had my blood type because guess what? The donor that I used before had the same blood type as my daughter. Wow. So I switched to an egg donor that had my blood type I switched to a new sperm donor that also had my blood type because I'm betting on black and I'm betting on me. And when I went back to do my final cycle, it was my final cycle. I was broke. Mm -hmm. um, it was 
if I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose because I did not go against my better judgment. Right. And I got one embryo. Oh my God. I was a third recipient for a donor egg and I got two eggs and one embryo. And that's my daughter. Oh my God. I was constantly looking at my money and trying to balance how much I can afford, how, how much further I can go, you know, before I called it quits. And so luckily I didn't have to call it quits without getting a baby, but it was really kind of like looking at my money and pretty much like on a weekly basis, looking right. and making sure, because remember, regardless of what happened, I would either have one baby or two babies and almost six figures in debt, right? That mm -hmm. I would still have yeah. to pay down while I'm paying for childcare, while I'm paying mm -hmm. for maternity leave, while I'm mm -hmm. paying for um, what have you. And so it was a real balancing act. I'm in a better position now that mm -hmm. the babies are here and a lot of the debt is behind me, but it is no, um, no measly feat to, you know, try to keep track of all of that. Um, so it was not easy, but I see a light at the end of the tunnel now. Thank you to our gracious guests, Hera and Aisha. For more information about Single Mothers by Choice, visit their website at mochasmc.com or their amazing podcast, Mocha SMC. And if you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to share, rate, and review. We want to hear from you. Here at The Maiden Myth, we replace fallacy with fact, trickery with truth, and assumption with assertion. It seems only right to counter the myth that began our episode with a powerful affirmation. Today's affirmation is, I am a powerful creator. I create the life I want and enjoy it. The Maiden Myth Podcast is produced by Philosophia Productions, mixed by Song Kung Nguyen. The music supervisor is Johnny Steele. The managing producer, Life Creative Group. Assistant producers, Sarah Benibo and Ronald and Doretta Stevens. Special thanks to Michelle Adewumni and Jennifer Edison. Want more? Join the Maiden Myth community at themaidenmyth.com. You can also find us on every podcast platform, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok, where you can leave a comment and join in the conversation.